So thank you to Ohad for the beautiful introduction. And uh, again, it's good to be finally back here. It's been a long time since I last sat in person and learned with you live. And I very much appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to learn together. Uh, today's shul is part of a two-part shiul, one this Wednesday, Bezat Hashem, and one next Wednesday. So we'll do the first half today, the second half next week. And uh, again, I want to start with a bracha. Thanks to all of you learning with me. That uh, Harav Dweck, who stands at the head, and all of those uh, who are involved in running this beautiful organization, the school is about Hashem. If we can, Am is still in the middle of a war. And uh, with your permission, I just want to say a short prayer for the soldiers of the state of Israel. They should go home, come home in peace. Bezrat Hashem, Mishem Adonai Borach Ma'atav Adonai, Mishem Borach Avotem Avraham Mitzrak Yaakov Yosef Moshe Aaron David Shlomo. Who is Borach Tchayil Yisrael? העומדים בשמר רצינו ועדו הם בגבול לבנון ועד מדבר מצרים ומן הים הגדול עד לבר והבבשה באוויר ובים ובכללם תלמידיי ובני קהילתנו ייתן לאדוני את אויבינו הקמים עלינו לגפים לפניהם הקדוש ברוך הוא ישמור וצית חיילנו לכל צרה וצוגה ומכל נגע ומחלה וישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם ידבר שונאינו תחתיהם ויעטרם בכתר ישועה ויעטר לנצחון וקם בהם הכתוב כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולך עמכם להילחם לכם עם אויביכם להושיעתכם ונאמר אמן Today's shiur is going to be about the personality of a posek. In particular, that of Rabbi Ben Sion Meir Chai Uziel, Harav Uziel, who I'm sure is no stranger to the people who study here in the Chabura, as well as the writings of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi, who's going to be the one shedding light on the methodology of Harav Uziel. What is the connection between the two? Harav Uziel was the rabbi of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. Rabbi Chaim David Halavi, aside from having studied in Shimat Porat Yosef, was also later in his life the secretary of Harav Uziel. Harav Uziel had a few secretaries throughout his life, but Rabbi Chaim David Halavi was very, very close on a personal level to Harav Uziel, and therefore is able to share with us certain insights and ideas into the way that Harav Uziel thinks or thought that perhaps other people don't have the opportunity to. Kind of reminds me, when you study the writings of Rabbeinu Avraham, Ben HaRambam, the son of the Rambam. You, know, you can learn Rambam from many people. But when you learn the Rambam from the son of the Rambam, all of a sudden you're, you're reading a commentary in the Torah and it says, My father, Zichonot Avraham, told me. Or, I heard in the Bet Midrash from my grandfather, from my father. That kind of insight that you have from a person who's intimately familiar with the Chacham, who they're speaking about, is something very unique. It's not something you find always. Uh, I can think, for example, uh, those of you who study with Harav Dweck, I'm sure he shares with you often stories of Chacham of Yosef that he experienced personally. And that's something that you don't get out of a book. You don't get that in an in a article. You can only get that from someone who spent time uh, with that Chacham. Uh, today in the morning, I had a brief uh, exchange with Rabbi Abe Faur, she live and be well. It's very special for me every time I have a question in the writing of his father, Allah Shalom, to be able to reach out to someone who, who knew in the ins and outs, the inner workings of such a personality, and to ask a question and to get an answer. So for today, I wish to focus on Rabbi Uziel, but through the lens of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. And then before I start, one final disclaimer. The disclaimer is that when we get into a persona, today we're studying the writings of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi as he discusses his Rabbi Harab Uziel. When you learn a piece of Torah from someone, you don't have to agree with everything you hear, everything you read. You can even study things. I know some people might, this might be very, very difficult for them. You can even study things you don't agree with. Haikar, that when you're studying that, you put yourself into the shoes of the person writing it. You know, there's a famous Chacham of Ashkenaz who once told the man who didn't believe in the divinity of the Torah. So it doesn't matter whether you believe the Torah is divine or not. But when you are reading the Torah, you should read it as if it's a divine book. Because according to you, whoever wrote the Torah, believed it was a divine book. Same here, we're reading something from Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. I'm certain there are some points, some halachic stances that we're not going to agree with Rabbi Uziel about. It doesn't matter. Right now, we're putting ourselves here in this place. And Bezat Hashem, our own, our own opinions and Ideas will come out when we publish our own Sifarim Bezat Hashem. When I was in London in 2022, I taught a shiur, accept the truth from whoever says it. And there I mentioned this Rambam that's on page one of my source sheet. I see I forgot to number the Rambam. The Rambam, the laws of Talmud Torah, warns us 
about the importance of studying Torah from a person who is worthy of studying Torah from. The first halakha actually tells us about the importance of teaching Torah only to students who are fitting to teach Torah too. En melamedim divrei Torah ele letalmid hagun. Na'e b'ma'asav. You only teach Torah to a good student who is also good in their actions. The Rambam then tells us in source bet, V'chen harav sheno holech b'derech Torah. If there is a chacham, a rabbi, who does not walk on a proper path. I know this might seem interesting to some because we assume that all Tamilich Hamim are good people, but as Mori Harav Peret once told me, we live in a very special generation where we have tremendous Tamilich Hamim who lack any shred of Yerat Shamayim. People that are very knowledgeable in Torah but have absolutely no good character to them. If there is a Tamil Chacham, theoretically, who has no good Midot, Afal Pishachacham Gadonhu, even though he's a great Chacham, Vechol Ha'am Tzarichinlo, and the whole nation needs him, En Mitlamedin Mimenu. We do not study Torah from him. Ad Shachzor Lamutav, until he does Teshuvah Shneemar, like it says, Ki Sifte Kohen Yishmeru Da'at, Vetorah Yivakshu Mipihu. Because the lips of a Kohen will protect knowledge, Vetorah Yivakshu Mipihu. That's when they should. Accept Torah from him. Ki malach Adonai tzevotu, for he is an angel of God. Amu chachamim, our sages say, im dome harav le malach Adonai tzevot. If the angel, if the rabbi is similar to the angel of a kadosh baruch hu, Torah yivakshu mipihu. They should learn Torah from him. Vim lav, and if not, al yivakshu Torah mipihu. They should not study Torah from him. It is impossible, teach us our chachamim, to divorce the personality of a chacham from the teachings. That he gives the world, or she gives the world. And this is something that is often overlooked. You know, I see many times people quote different chachamim, especially in books of halakha, this posseg, that posseg, this rabbi, that rabbi. It's very clear to me, it's very clear to me that the chacham who is a strict person, who is an inconsiderate person, a cruel person, not a person who is very sensitive, that their piske halacha, their teachings of Torah, almost always come out in the, in the area of, it's better not to, you should be strict, it doesn't matter what you're going to lose. That whole personality comes to light in the piske halacha of that person. Often you'll find that the person who's very kind and compassionate and generous and sincere is the one who's that Personality comes out in their writings of halakha. And there are so many very interesting piske halakha that people are sometimes confused by. And then you look for a moment and say, but do you understand truly the personality of the person who wrote this? Because if you understood who they were, you wouldn't have the questions, both positive or negative, on this person. And my thesis, and that of Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, in this entire Shio series, both this week and next week, is that you cannot divorce the personality from the posseg. The Chacham is always going to have inside of their teachings who they are. And that's why our Chachamim warn us, do not do not learn Torah from somebody who's not a good person. What do you mean do not learn Torah? But just Torah, I'm learning Torah, I'll take what I want, throw away what I don't want. And the answer is that you're probably not going to be able to recognize just how deep their bad character penetrates the Torah teachings that you're absorbing from them. Even in the nuance, even in the, in the subtleties of the Torah, you're always going to walk away having been influenced by the negativity of a Chacham who is not good. And this is something that I think is a Musa Haskel, something we can learn from all of us. To make sure that the people we study Torah with, and here is not a problem, and this bit of Midash is not a problem, not just that they are competent Torah scholars, but they are kind people, that they are good people. And this leads us exactly to the essay of Rabbi Chaim David Halevi in his book, Asel Harav. Unfortunately, this series seems to be out of print. Uh, I tried to buy numerous copies in recent years and it's not something I'm able to find. Uh, in general, the writings of Rabbi Uziel are difficult to find. Rabbi Chaim David Halavi has made a little bit of a comeback. He's made a comeback, though only a partial comeback. You see, in the religious Zionist world in Israel, these denominations are not mine, that's what people self-identify. There was the desire in recent years, how can we study halakha from poskim that are not Zionists? So let's go look for a posek who is Zionist. And in the digging of the archives, they discovered, wow, there was this rabbi who lived not so long ago when he was alive. Most of us ignored him. And he wrote books in halakha. And so his works in recent years have been republished. All of his works in halakha. But come his works in thought, 
and the way he approached the world and machashava and his hashkafat olam and the way that he viewed society, all of those books have remained unpublished because we only want to take what we want to take and we don't want to take the things we don't want to take. One rabbi who really brought Harab Uziel and Rabbi Chaim Dibet Halevi to the consciousness of the English-speaking world is Rabbi Mark Angel. Uh, he, he published a very special work on Harab Uziel. One day, B'zalat Hashem, this book will be back in print. From what I understand right now is that it's not Loving Truth and Peace, the Grand Religious World View of Rabbi Ben Sion Uziel. And a book on Rabbi Chaim David Halevi called a gentle scholar and courageous thinker. I think this one you could still find in the shuk today, in the market. Uh, both of these books are gold. And if a person really wants to understand who each of these unique Tamilei Chamim were, I cannot recommend enough to find these books, read them, know them, and they will open your eyes and your heart. Let's read. Page one. Quoting a Teshuvah here from the series Asen Kharav. Volume 8, Siman Tzadizai, 97. Rabbi Chaim David Halavi titles this essay, Pesikat Halakha, the ruling of Halakha, the word posek means, what does the word posek mean? I actually don't know the etymology, of the, in terms of how long we've been using this word, the Sfaradim uses the word, the Ashkenazim uses this word, but the meaning, when we say posek, what does it mean? You're allowed to unmute yourself. Or don't. Posek is the Hebrew word. Chotech. To cut, to decide. The English the word decisor. Someone who is decisive and is able to make decisions in halakha. You know, today you go to a rabbi, you ask a rabbi halakha question. How does the rabbi answer your halakha question? Eh, it's better not to. Or, you know, there's a machloket. You should maybe be, maybe be strict about it. Or, you know, there are many opinions. I don't want to stick my head between the great mountains. You know, this is usually when you ask someone a halakha question, this is how they answer. I once heard from the uh, French Sephardic philosopher, Chacham Manitou. Uh, he, said, he said, you know, a, a posek is somebody who is decisive. He says, uh, Mishnah tells us, Asel charav, make for yourself a rabbi, v'histalek. Oh, had people are able to unmute themselves in this classroom or they're all unmute? They're able to unmute. Yeah. No, the Mishnah. Asel Kharav, make for yourself a rabbi. Vehistalek. Vehistalek min asavek. Thank you, Rachel. And you will avoid any kind of doubt. So, meaning having a rabbi means that when you ask a question, you will not get an answer that is full of doubt. He said, today, we don't have poskim. We have... Uh, Sfekot. Sveke, I don't know what we have. The rabbi is not a posek. He's a safek. Everything you ask him, he doesn't know. And here we have the same problem. There are people in the world that are not decisive, but here Harav Uziel is a posek. And his pesikat halacha is very much influenced, says Rabbi Chaim Libra Halevi, by Ahavat Israel, by the love of the Jewish people. And Rabbi Chaim David Halevi wants to show us that pesikat halacha of Ahavat Israel b'mishnat Harav ben Zion Uziel. And let's read. L'chora hanosei asher he'emanu l'beru. Seemingly, says Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, this topic which we have come to clarify. And by the way, as I was researching this essay, Mamash, last night, or I don't remember if it was a few nights ago, I discovered that Rabbi Angel, of all people, I just mentioned him, Litova, again I mentioned Litova, he translated this essay in, a, in one of the journals in the East Coast into English. So if you'd like to find it in English, you're able to find this essay in English. This topic which I've brought up, in the way in which I've brought it up, that, Pesikat halacha and Avat Yisrael are intertwined. Hu absurd. That's not a Hebrew word, but it means it's absurd. V'chima kesher yesh ben Avat Yisrael pesikat halacha. What connection is there between the love of your Jewish people and ruling halacha? V'halo halacha nifseket efi yusodot hilchatiim iuniim. You rule halachot based on principles and fundamentals of halacha. An analysis of those things. Uma ben halacha and Avat Yisrael. What is the connection between halacha? אין אהבת ישראל. אבל, בת, מי שהכיר מקרוב את מרן הרב עוזיאל זצ"ל, anyone who knew from close, הרב עוזיאל, you know, my, my practice is not to call anybody מרן, except for the שולחן ערוך. 
Uh, it, it gets very confusing. I read a book, Maran, 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 Maran. All of a sudden, it turns out we're not talking about the Shulchan Aruch. We're talking about somebody else who lives somewhere else and maybe still even alive today. For me, there's one Maran. I say Maran. Everybody else can get all the titles in the world. I only say, but the other people are not careful. Uh, for them, and for maybe sincerely for Harav Chaim David Hadavi, he was his Maran. Maran Harav Uziel Zatzal, Yada Shishiuto Haita Mutbat Bechotem Shlavat Chesed Varachamim, Lechol Hanivra Betzelem Enosh. Anyone who knew Harav Uziel from close knew that ingrained inside of him was the love of all humanity who were created in the image of God. And how much more so to the Jewish people who are called the children of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. By the way, this distinction is very important. It comes from the Ber Midrash of Harav Uziel. Rabbi Chaim Divin Halavi studied both by Harav Kuk and by Harav Uziel. There was a famous war between Harav Kuk and Harav Uziel in Halakha, not a personal war, in Halakha about organ donation as it relates to, uh, uh, not, not just organ donation, but um, medical autopsies and cadavers and the study of uh, science and medical school and whether you could use bodies uh, that are Jewish bodies, non-Jewish bodies. Famously, Harav Uziel made, uh, Harav Kuk made some kind of distinction between Jewish bodies and non-Jewish bodies, uh, one that seemingly you could perform autopsies on and one that you could not. And Harav Uziel argued entirely that this was incorrect, that all human beings are created in the image of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not just Jewish people. The Torah didn't have Jewish people when it says that he made them in the image of God. And this is part and parcel of the whole world view of Harav Uziel. And recently the Chavurat published a book in the writings of Rabbi Eliyahu ben Amozik, who we can talk about was the, one of the most beautiful and poetic universalist Jewish thinkers that, that perhaps ever was given to us as a gift by a Kedosh Baruch Hu. And when I read the writings of Harav Uziel, for example, it reminds me, there is a, a tinge there of the same humanism, the same values, that all human beings are precious. It happens to be that on top of that, we also believe there's a special uniqueness to Am Yisrael. It doesn't take away from our being special that other human beings are special also. And it cannot be that that heart which beat inside of it the love of humanity, that you won't find that same beating heart inside of his piske halacha. Because I am a witness, says Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. I'm a witness that Dahavat Israel permeated every aspect of his public life. So that I'm not able to stop here and share with you all the stories that I saw in the life of Rabbi Uziel that show this Ahavat Israel. It's not the time or the place. In fact, Rav. Chaim David Halavi published a short book. Uh, this book is out of print for many years. Uh, a short biography of his rabbi, Harab Uziel. And in it are beautiful stories that he has, personal stories that he experienced with Harab Uziel. It's that I believe wholeheartedly that Rav Uziel's personality of Ahavat Yisrael, Ahavat Abriyot, of loving human beings, is found in all of his Piske Alecha. And I want to make it very clear that nonetheless, it was not a deviation from the principles on which Halacha is founded. And here he inserts a little story. Do we have time for a story? Let's look at a footnote. He said, I want to share with you a personal story that really left a big impression on me. Hezekim Dumani Bishna Tafshin Tet. It was the year 1949, about. The chief rabbi of Israel, you know, in the early years of the state of Israel, it's not like it doesn't exist today, but in the early years of the state of Israel, there was a lot of conversation surrounding the public observance of Shabbat or desecration of Shabbat, I would say that way, in the Israeli public. And you find that many rabbis, Arab David Shalush, Rabbi Moshe Malka, otherwise moderate Safar Chachamim also were very involved in how do we get the people to keep Shabbat in public. He remembers the chief rabbinate made a whole convention to, to protest the public Shabbat desecration in the state of Israel. And Rav Uziel came, he was the chief rabbi. He passed away in 1953. 
1949, he was still the chief rabbi, and he gave a very moving speech all about Shabbat. V'kara mitoch bechi et pesukei nechamia yud gimel al chilule haShabbat biyerushalayim shotam yamim. And he read in tears, in tears, Rav Uziel spoke the pesukim from Nechemia that talk about the public desecration of Shabbat in Yerushalayim. Betzetom me'atzeret. Immediately when he left this convention, they called a taxi to drive him back to his home. In those years in Israel, there was a shortage of gasoline. And so every car owner had to take one day a week they didn't drive. It's a, you know, Israel is an interesting country like that. And so you would put in your window the day that you took not to drive. And the ones that wrote Shin, you knew that they don't drive on Shabbat. And that was a Shomer Shabbat taxi. And his advisors, his assistants who were there, and they had just heard this emotional speech and they were still on this high, Rav Uziel told us we have to keep Shabbat in Yerushalayim. They told Rav Uziel, you know, maybe it's better you don't take the taxi that's Mechal Shabbat. The rabbi of Uziel didn't listen to them. And he entered the taxi, and they were all a little bewildered. You know, you just gave a speech about keeping Shabbat. How do you promote a business that doesn't observe Shabbat? And Rav Uziel said the following words in bold on page one on the left side. I don't uh, excommunicate or write off any Jewish person personally. Even if he's not Shomer Shabbat. I'm waging a war now as the chief rabbi of Israel. The Jewish people in the land of Israel must keep Shabbat. But it's not a personal war. There is no individual in the world that I'm fighting. I love Jewish people. I love my nation. It's the love of my nation that causes me to speak. But not chas v'shalom to hate, but to cancel people. I have a few more stories like this of Uziel, but I'm afraid if I tell stories that uh, you and I won't finish even the amount that I wanted to cover today. Amar Rabbi Abba, Amar Shemuel. Rabbi Abba says, name Shemuel, Shalosh shanim nechleku bet shamayu bet hilel. For three years, bet shamayu and bet hilel were arguing. Halal omrim halacha kmotenu, venu omrim halacha kmotenu. They were arguing, bet hilel says halacha is like me, bet shamayu says halacha is like me. A voice comes out of heaven. I have a shiur somewhere on the internet explaining all the different opinions. What is a bat kol? But a heavenly voice come out, comes out and tells them, elu elu Elohim chayim hen. These words and those words are all the words of the living God. But the law is like bet hilen. Now, there's some fascinating conversations here surrounding you know, this, this teaching of our rabbis is often misused. Everything in the world, even the worst things in the world, all of it's part of the living God. Uh, today when I spoke with Harav Abe Faur, he mentioned that the original Girsa in the manuscript form of Eruvin is different and I didn't have a chance yet to sit and look at what he was referring to. But for right now, let's deal with what's in front of us. Bet Hinel and Bet Shammai are both the words of the living God, but says his heavenly voice, the halakha is like Bet Hinel. Ask the Talmud. If both of them are the words of the living God, so what merit did Bet Hillel have that Halakha should be like them? Because they were Nochim, they were very um, um, pleasant, and Aluvim. Aluvim is almost a negative word, very humble, but like exceedingly humble. Vishonim divrehem vidivre Bet Shamayim. And when they would study Torah, they would always mention their opinion and the opinion of Bet Shammai. They never neglected to mention that there were those who disagreed with them. So when I first came to the United States, I learned a Ben Midrash, Arab Peretz, every single time we study Halakha. Sephardim, we do the Ashkenazim, they do that. Sometimes the Yemenites, the Temanim do that. Those, the Rambam, like this, Shukhan Ruch, like that, the Ramah, like this. And when I came to the United States and I started teaching Halakha, I got in big trouble, not because of the reasons you think. That came later. Rather, people said, what are you always, you're being so divisive. Every halakha you teach, Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, Ashkenazim. Until you came, we all did one thing. Now you're telling us there's two different things. Until now, the Ashkenazim who were teaching you Torah never told you Sephardim existed. So I came to the world and said, I don't want to teach Torah only according to Sephardim. It's not fair. 
Why should I have a student of mine who is Ashkenazi, who has a long tradition of Torah and Halakha and his fathers and his grandparents, and, and I'm going to pretend they don't exist? No, I'm going to tell you what my opinion is, but also let you know what other people say. That was considered divisive. It's better to just pretend there's only one opinion, my opinion. Bet Hillel is the one who taught us that. They can have their opinion always to mention though the words of Bet Shammai. Maran, and Shulchan Aruch does this also. Yesh Omrim, Yesh Omrim, Yesh Omrim. Drives people crazy why he says Yesh Omrim. But again, Maran Anvatan Haya, he was humble. I have an opinion on Halakha, but I'm mentioning other opinions. Vilod, and furthermore, Ela Shemakdimim Divrei Bet Shammai Ledivrehem. They would always put the words of Bet Shammai before their words. But Maran does this also in Shulchan Aruch. Maran, when he has Yesh Omrim, Yesh Omrim, Yesh Omrim, always the Halakha is like the last one. Like we have a famous argument about, among the sukkah. Let's skip the story. On page two at the top. Why skip? I don't like to skip. Masech HaTukah tells the story here. The elders of Bet Shammai and the elders of Bet Hillel went to go visit Rabbi Yochanan ben Achoranit. And they found him that his head and most of his body was in the sukkah and his table was inside of his house. A tiny sukkah. You know, when you read these halachot, you wonder who built a sukkah like that. But I guess Rabbi Yochanan built a sukkah like that. Amu Bet Shammai misham raya. Afem amu lo im kach hait anoheg lo kiyam te mitzvah sukkah miyamecha. They argue, they said, if that's the way that you observe this halakha, you've never fulfilled the mitzvah of sukkah. So if both of them, their words are correct, and again the Talmud says, why did they deserve that halakha should be like bet hilel? Savlanin means they were tolerant. They were patient. What, do you determine a halakha because of the personality of Bet Hillel? It doesn't make any sense. It's either Bet Shammai is right because of a logical proof, or Bet Hillel is right because of a logical proof. But because the personality of Bet Hillel was nice, that's why the halakha is like them. But in order to answer that question, we first have to answer a different question that the early Chachamim, the Rishonim, already spoke about. The rabbis of France, and I know I'm going to say here the rabbis of France, certain people are not going to be happy. doesn't matter. The rabbis of France, they already wrote the following. The Ritba in his commentary on Masechet Eruvin writes the following. How can both opinions be the words of the living God if one prohibits and one permits? And the rabbis of France answered. That when Moshe Rabbeinu ascended to heaven to receive the Torah, they showed him 49 reasons to prohibit something and 49 reasons to permit something. And Moshe Rabbeinu asked the Baruch Hu, what's the deal? Why? 49 reasons to permit? 49 reasons to prohibit? And he said, That this decision between Mutar and Asur should be given to the hands of the Chachamim of the Jewish people in every generation. And the decision, the ultimate decision will be theirs. And this is correct according to Drasha. And like the Mekubalim always say, that their Torah is the Emet. And according to the truth of Kabbalah, there's something here, I'm not involved in Kabbalah. The Ravad writes, and this is how he says it. And if a person who has in him a hint of heresy tells you, I don't believe the Torah is true because look at the rabbis who argue so many places in Halakha. I'm in doubt. You should hit his teeth and tell him. Where do we find this uh, sentence of hitting his teeth? Chayim 
Chavit, there's a little button on your screen. It says mute. In the Haggadah of Pesach, very good. He's a Rasha. You should hit his teeth and tell him, Shelo nichleku avotenu akdoshim rabotenu zan leolam bikar mitzvah. Our Chachamim never argued on the essence of a mitzvah. Ele betol doteha, only on the, the details of a mitzvah. ששמעו יקרה מרבותיהם, ולא שאלו על תולדותיהם מפני שלא שימשו כל צורכם. The arguments, the confusion is only on the details that they forgot to ask their rabbis about because they did not study well enough from the Chachamim before them. דרך משל, for example, לא נחלקו אם מדליקים נר שבת או לא. The argument is not about whether or not you light Shabbat candles. על מה נחלקו? What do they argue about? במה מדליקים? We read the Mishnah. What oil can you use? Which wicks can you use? They don't have an argument whether you read Shema or whether you don't. What do they argue about? From when do you read Shema? And this is similar to every area of Halakha. Nobody questions whether we keep Shabbat or we don't, or whether we're allowed to cook on Shabbat or not allowed to cook on Shabbat. The question is, what is cooking on Shabbat? At which point is it considered cooking on Shabbat? There's never a question at the essence of the Halakha. Rather, on the details, and what do we chalk that up to? To the fact, that some Chachamim didn't study as well as others, and therefore, there's some confusion in the areas of Halakha. So practical conclusions, Nikol Hana Lamanu, we learn four things. One, Shiyesh Yikare Mitzvah, that there are fundamental principles of every mitzvah. Velo zo bilvad ha-mefurashot b'Torah u-mekubalot b'anachal ha-Moshe b'Sinai, u-vahen en makom l-machlok et klal, el afilu takanot k'dumo shal chazan, k'adakad n'er Shabbat, hare hen ikar mitzvot, shlo chala b'en makhloket. When we say that there are mitzvot, that in the foundations of them there's no argument, we're not just talking on halachal ha-Moshe b'Sinai on mitzvot that were given directly. We're talking about, even in, in the decrees of our rabbis, everyone agrees there is such a decree. But, there are details, that's where the arguments lay. Two, betoldot ha-mitzvot b'atehen, chalu machlokot mipnei shlo shimshu kod tzorkam. Why are there arguments? Because certain chachamim didn't study well enough. Like we mentioned in Masechet Sanhedrin, that when the students of Hillel and Shammai increased, that's when all the arguments began. Because they had not studied Torah properly. Top left of page 2. Machloket zo ena ke machloket regila ben bnei adam bechol shitchei hachayim. This is not a usual argument. When you have arguments in halakha, it's not a regular argument that you have in your day-to-day life. Shetzad echad bidvad echol yot tzodek. That only one side is, tr- is, is, is right now daytime or is it nighttime and not that I'm in San Diego and you're in the United Kingdom. The question is we're both standing outside. Is it night or is it day? Is that tree green or is that tree brown? What color is the tree? That's a, there's an objective truth here. Every one of these halachic arguments has what to base itself on. There are 49 reasons this way, 49 reasons that way, and the Batei Din of every generation, Sanhedrin for example, uh, the primary example, has the authority to determine between one halakha or another halakha based on their decisions. Yesh klalim beruim, the fourth, there are clear principles, the psikal chatit bekon machloket. Every time we have an argument in halakha, there are clear ways in which we determine what we do or don't do. Whether it's the, the rabbis of the Mishnah or the rabbis of the Talmud. There are all kinds of methods that we use. You know, they're the rules of halakha, how we engage in halakha. Nonetheless, and therefore a posek in every generation has the ability to look at halakha and say, I'm not going to deviate from the principles of this halakha, notice principles, but I am going to take into consideration who's asking me the question. What is the situation that we're in right now? What is the world doing right now? How does that work? The first Chachamim to really ever have an argument in Halakha, Bet Shamayim Bet Hilel. Asher nechleku b'cheshlosh ma'ot halachot. There were 300 halachot about that they argued on. Kamuvan, 
כל המחלוקות נוצרו בבעיות שהתעוררו מסביב להלכות פסוקות ומקובלות, אלא שבפרט מסוים לא הייתה הלכה ברורה בידם, או במקרה חדש לא נתעוררו בה בו לפני כן. And the arguments that they had in these 300 halachot were again not about principles. Do we keep Shabbat? Do we not? Do we put on tefillin? Do we not? Rather on details. Details that either were fuzzy because people did not study well enough or there were new questions that came up and they required new solutions and there was an argument as to how best to apply earlier halacha to this new situation. Harbe amal hushka b'parshanut yisodot shitatam shal bet shamay Many people have tried to give different reasons why Bet Shammai always are stringent most of the time, Bet Hillel most of the time are lenient. And it says Rabbi Chaim David Hanavi, likely all of those different understandings have what, uh, some foundation. He said, I wish to focus on one teaching that was alluded to in the rabbinic source we mentioned earlier. We said that if both of them are the words of the living God, one of them says yes, one of them says no, so how could that be? How can halakha then be like one of them? And we said that was because of the personality of Bet Hillel. Nirali, it seems to me, shekan ramzu lanu raboteinu et yesod shitat Bet Hillel hamekilim. This is really the foundation of why Bet Hillel are lenient. Both of them are the words of the living God, as we explained. That if the Chachamim were to be stringent or to be lenient, both of them are still allowed to do that. There's a famous story, you remember? Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. Hillel and Shammai were both approached by someone to convert to Judaism. Shammai rejects that person. Hillel accepts that person. This happens three different times with three different people. How could it be that Bet Hillel accepts somebody who seems to be coming to convert for the wrong reasons? How could Bet Shammai reject somebody that Hillel thinks is converting for the right reasons? The answer to that is very simple. That a chacham in a given situation always has to look at the situation. There is no objective halakha here, do I convert this person, do I not convert this person? It's what do I feel? A person cannot rule against what they believe to be correct. And just like Bet Shammai was permitted to reject them, Bet Hillel was permitted to accept them. There is no right or wrong there. Later in history, the Talmud tells us that these three gerim meet each other, and what do they say? That the stringency of Shammai wanted to remove us from the world, and the humility of Hillel is that which accepted us again. Anvatanuto, their character, is what brought us in. V'lachen and therefore, Bet Hillel shenochim va'aluvim hayu, Bet Hillel who were of this humble character, Savlanim hayu, they were patient, they were tolerant, Chashu anvatanutam v'savlanutam et ha-metziut, because they were so sensitive, they were able to pick up, they were tuned in to the reality, et chushat ha-adam, to the weakness of a person, it's kosheh ha'chaim, the difficulty of life, or kshayeh ha'chaim, et ha-metziyut she'ena to'em et tamid et ha-teoria, that sometimes reality doesn't always fit with a theory. It's very nice that you have an objective halakha you want everyone to keep, but the people out there are not able to do it. Ve't ha-ratzon v'chadome, u'pasku l'fi ha-samchut ha-mesura bi-adam l'kula, and therefore they were lenient sometimes, because they were tuned in to the needs of people. Vidu bet shamayim, Bet Shammai, on the other hand, Shekabdanim hayu, who they were very particular. Lo chashu b'chol hanal. They didn't take into consideration all of these factors in other people's lives. V'natu lifsok l'fi ota samchut atzma l'achmir. And the same authority that Hillel had to rule leniently, they took that authority and ruled stringently. And so you see that two different people, two different schools of thought, what really determined which way they would rule the halakha, it was not an argument over the foundation, the principles of halakha, but over the application of the halakha that is written, that we have studied, to the people that are sitting in front of us. Do we expect that people are just going to do what the law tells them to do? Or do we try it in some way or another to bridge the gap between the law and the reality that the people live in? And I'm certain that what I'm telling you sounds dangerous. So let me give you two Talmudic examples. I'll summarize this first part of the shiur 
And I'll let you go with those thoughts in mind, hopefully answering that question. Says Rabbi Chaim de I have two examples. And don't be lost. All of this is intended to explain to us exactly how Harav Uziel's personality affected his methodology of halakha. Tanur Rabbanan, a rabbi's taught us. Ketzad miragdim bifnei akala. How do you dance in front of the kala? I'll tell you why the rabbis had this question. Because probably they were at my wedding. You know what my wedding looked like? I got married in Tiferes Mordechai Bells. All I could tell you is that the Great Wall of China is shorter than the Mechita that was at my wedding. And so what ended up happening, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that under the chupa they let me stand together with my wife. But for the rest of the wedding, I didn't see that lady. And it was like I, I got married to all the men on this side of the room. I just had a chupa and then she was whisked away to another universe. Uh, which is a crazy reality. But that's the reality that many people uh, get married in. If you can imagine, even her face, even her face I didn't see. Uh, she was, um, one day you'll come to my house, I'll show you a picture. Imagine you see those ISIS war brides and you see like some guy in his, that's what Masha was, uh, I felt like at the wedding. But I got married. Like Khan wants to get married, so that part we passed. But at the wedding, you can imagine that if I would go over to the Kala and dance in front of her, uh, it reminds me of a scene out of the Talmud that the, uh, people stoning each other with etogim. I would have been killed. I would have taken things off the table and, and, and it murdered me. But here it's an explicit teaching of our Chachamim. How do you dance in front of the Kala? Meaning, Jewish people, in our culture, we have a tradition that we dance before the Kala. Bet Shammai Omrim, Bet Shammai say, Kala kemot shehi. The question here is, what do you tell the Kala when you're dancing in front of her? By the way, so it's not just that you're dancing in front of the bride, but you're also communicating with her. Chas v'shalom. I know it's a crazy thing. Uh, what do you tell her? Rashi says, Ma umrim lefaneha. Bet Shammai says, Kemochi, meaning, find something truthful about her, how nice she looks, how sweet she is, or midot, whatever you like, and say that to her. Bet Hillel umrim. Bet Hillel says, Kala na'a v'chasuda. What a beautiful, pious bride. Amun ha'em bet shamay bet hilel. Bet shamay has a problem with this, saying a standard sentence to the bride. Harei shayta chigeret o suma, omrim la kala na v'chasuda. What if she is not so beautiful, or not so special, she has some kind of uh, deficiency? How can you tell her that she's beautiful? The Torah amra midvar sheker tichag. The Torah commands us explicitly you are, must stay away from lies. You're not allowed to lie. Amun lehem bet hilel, bet shamay. Bet hilel tells the bet shamay. The divrechem, mi shalakach mekara min ashuk, yishabachenu b'enav, o yigenenu b'enav. If someone goes and buys a new house, a new car, something they're really happy about. I just gave a show recently on the word lakach, about taking a woman, it's not about buying a woman, the word yikachena, it's, it means, we, we use it in this sense, but it's originally not like that. Havi Omer, that's why our Chachamim intend to use the word, intentionally use the word kidushin, it's a better word. Havi Omer Yishabachenu Benav, if someone buys something new, a beautiful house, you're going to come to that, wow, what an ugly house you have. Someone buys a brand new car, Psh, that's a car you bought, it's ugly. So someone just got into a relationship, they're getting married, are you going to come to them and tell them what an ugly bride you have? From here our rabbis told us, A person's mind should always be involved with the people. You have to think a little bit. Some common sense wouldn't hurt you. It's not nice to come to somebody's wedding and say bad things about their bride. And how could both the words of Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel be the words of the living God? The words of Bet Shammai are, are built. They're founded on a solid verse in the Torah. You're not allowed to lie. And there's nothing truer than the Pasuk says, I cannot lie. So if she's ugly, how can I lie? But if everyone told the truth all the time, I just want to say it the way it is. Then human society would never function. I think there's a, a movie like that. Uh, it's been many years since I was uh, 
something about a guy who couldn't lie, and everywhere he goes, he's busy telling the truth to everybody, and the whole world hates him. Really, the whole world doesn't want to hear everything that's true about you. And what are you going to do to the relationship between a man and a woman when you tell the partner all the bad things about their spouse? He loves her. He thinks she's beautiful. That's why he married her. You don't have to marry her. She's not your bride. He found her. He loves her. He wants her. Get out of their business. And in his mind, she is a beautiful person. And therefore there's no lie here, because even Bet Hillel is insisting on the truth. The truth is that when I say she's beautiful, it means that to the groom, she must be very beautiful. One of them is basing themselves on a verse, and one of them is basing themselves on reality. The reality is that we cannot go around denigrating people's spouses in front of them just because it's true. That's not a normal way to live our life. You know, just in general, I'm going to say something. Usually in my Bede Midrash, I give Musa, and outside of the Bede Midrash, I try not to give Musa. But I will tell you there are times that also saying nice things about people can be bad. You know, Chachamim tell us that saying Lashon Hara is not always saying good, uh, bad things. For example, if you compliment someone's enemy in front of them, you, you know these two people are fighting. You say, hey, you know your friend Bob? Bob is such a great guy, but this person hates Bob. So what are you causing? You're causing Lashon Hara now here because you're, you're antagonizing this person. Sometimes people, I see they do it in public a lot. They want to compliment their spouse. Husband, he's the best. He's so amazing. He makes a lot of money. He wears nice clothes. He's so good to me. He takes the kids on walks every day. He, well, a wonderful person. He takes me every week to dinner. We have a date night. We hire a babysitter. Come on. You think you're saying nice things about your spouse. But all of your friends who are sitting around the table, they have beautiful spouses too. Good men, good women. But their spouse doesn't take the kids for walks. Or their spouse doesn't have the ability to hire a babysitter once a week and take you to dinner. And so now what you do, wow, what a good husband. My husband's a jerk. Wow, what a beautiful wife. My wife is good for nothing. Sometimes even praising a person can be the Shonara. Says uh, Bet Hillel, we have to look at the reality of the situation and not just say whatever is true. The second example. This one is perhaps a little bit less personal. Shanina, we would learn. If someone comes to steal something. Tanura Banana, Rabbi Seah, Kol Davar Pesha, over there in Shemot, it talks about all of the crimes that a person will commit. If you think of stealing a pikadon, there's an English word for pikadon that is slipping my mind right now. A deposit. So if you think of stealing that picadon, that deposit, it's already a crime, says Beit Shammai. You're only guilty of stealing when you actually steal, when you send your hand and take it. But just to think of stealing does not make you a criminal. Because it says, It says about any kind of crime. Meaning, it should even include the thought. It comes to mean, you have to do it with your hand. So what does the Pasuk mean? Anything that you, any crime that you think you, you're committing. It means that not only if you commit a crime, but if one of the people who works for you or your messenger or your servant, they commit a crime, that you're guilty for it also. Here you find again, the two people are learning the same pasuk differently. But their principles, the same pasuk that they're studying, both of them see in it something else. And therefore both opinions can be true. There is no logical way to prove one way or the other. Rather, every Chacham has his own approach. And if I had to tell you, the idea of Bet Shammai is, you're not allowed to steal. Even the thought of stealing is a crime. Along comes Bet Hilin and says, hey, if we get punished for every single Adela we think about, do you know how much teshuvah we're going to need to be doing? Do you know how many criminals are going to be in the world? Everyone who thought of doing an avirah is now a, a terrible person. 
By the way, Rabbeinu Avraham, uh, Rabbeinu Arambam, he has an introduction to Perkei Avot. It's a beautiful uh, book, a short book on human psychology. And there he mentions, our Chachamim tell us that thinking of doing an Avera is worse than actually doing an Avera. You show that reality proves it otherwise. I think there are many people who want to do an Avera, and they finally commit the Avera, and then they realize, wow, that wasn't as exciting as I thought it was going to be. So usually you feel the other way is true. But here, Rabbeinu Aram says, what does it mean that a person who thinks of doing an Avera, it's worse than one who commits the Avera? He explains the following, he says, you know, the only difference between us and an animal is that we both have bodies, we both have desires and needs and wants, that we have a mind. The Rambam's whole, whole philosophy, the mind is the, is the most sacred thing in the world. The connection between the intellect of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and that of a human being is, a, is a, a profound part of the Rambam's teachings. The Rambam says, if you do an Avera with your body, it's normal. Bodies do Avera, bodies have wants, they have needs, they have lusts, they have desires. But your mind? How can you corrupt your mind? The one part of you that is so sacred, the one part of you that is divine, that's the part you want to hurt? in our generation. Yesh pesikam beruah. There is a clear approach to halakha. Maybe not anymore. V'chen kedale pesikam mekubalim. There's accepted ways in which we rule halakhot. V'afal piken, nonetheless, yesh lo'oto yisod gadol shel nochim v'aluvim basis gadol bepesikam. The personality of the posek still has a very large part in determining the outcome of how we analyze the halakha. Kizeh kocha shel Torah Hashem. Shi Torah ha-netzach. This is the power of the strength of the Torah that is an eternal Torah. And there would not have been an eternal Torah if this system didn't exist, that a posek, using the foundational principles of halakha, and only from within the principles of halakha, and while taking into consideration the weakness, the needs of human beings, like Beti Len, that were humble and were tolerant. The poskim, the real halachic desires of every generation, they know how to use these rules, how to operate within the framework of halacha, but not to forget the people who the halacha is intended to be applied to. This idea is something that is found very often in the writings of Rabbi Chaim David Halevi. You see, we're raised in an orthodoxy that tells us that the Torah is eternal. What does it mean Torah is eternal? The Torah is static and the Torah is, is always one way. You can never change it. It's always going to be this way. But only someone who doesn't know Torah can speak like that. And the rigidity of the Torah is what proves how eternal it is that in every generation that you hear always, this is the speech of orthodoxy. Hashem, we don't suffer from the illness of being orthodox. And we are able instead to learn Torah properly. And so when one studies Torah, thank God, outside of the framework of orthodoxy, one can understand what makes the Torah eternal, says Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. The very fact that the Torah is flexible. I know it sounds a crazy thing to put together with halakha. My wife has a shiul. She may have even touted at the chabura, I don't recall. Called the elastic clause. Rabbi Chaim David Halavi's essay on the flexibility of halakha. Halakha, yes, there are principles of halakha. We do keep Shabbat. We do eat kasher. We do put on tefillin. We do, but there are, in the details, there is room to take human beings and their needs into consideration. If you know who those human beings are, you know what the generation needs. Dor, dor, vedor shav every generation, and the thing that that generation needs. There's nice that you have a theory, but the theory doesn't work. Not for the regular people, not for everybody. So what are you going to do when your theory doesn't match reality? You know, Rebbe David Halavi mentions this also in the area of civil law. Those of you in my New York shiul, Mishpat Tzedek, we've discussed already for a few months this idea that a Kadosh Baruch Hu intentionally left the civil laws of the Torah vague. There are principles, but they're lacking details. There is no exact way in how a Jewish government must operate. Yes, principles, but not details. Every other area of halakha, tefillin, mezuzot, there are details to what color, what shape, what size, what direction. All of a sudden comes the areas of civil law and national law. 
HaKadosh Baruch leaves gaping holes. This is in order to maintain the eternity of the Torah. Because if the Torah was going to be rigid in the method of government that the Jewish people needed, then as society changed, and as values change, and human beings change, and their, their perceptions of life change, technology changes. Rabbi Uziel mentions this in the introduction to his book, his uh, Shalot V'Chuvot. Mishpatei Uziel. He mentions that a posek must take into consideration all of the facets of life before determining a halakha. Because what was yesterday is not today, and what is today is not going to be tomorrow. HaKadosh Baruch left holes in his Torah so that human beings can fill them. And anyone who's read any writings of Sephardi Chachamim, how we are active readers of a Torah, active receivers of a Torah, and not passive readers of a Torah. We don't just do whatever HaKadosh Baruch throws at us. The human beings are intimately involved in the perfection of the world. There are three partners in the creation of the world, tell our rabbis. A father, a mother, and a Kadosh Baruch partners in the creation of the world. Our Chachamim believe in this wholeheartedly. Look at the Rambam Moray Nebuchim about the Brit Milah. But human beings being involved. HaKadosh Baruch wanted us to be circumcised. Why were we not born that way? HaKadosh Baruch wants us to be involved in His perfection of humanity. The same with the Torah. The Torah is not a book that was given to us to accept passively. But in every generation we are active in our pursuit of the truth of the Torah as it relates to the people around us. If I could say one of the Chachamei Ashkenaz he writes the Mishnah in Perkei Avot, says, Moshe kibel Torah misinai, yom sarali Yoshua, Yoshua is getting, the, the transmission of the oral law, and then it says, vehem amru shloshah devarim, the anshe keneset ha-gedolah, the men of the great assembly, they said three things. And then it tells us the three things. It says this Chacham, why is it that it mentions, they said three things? We can count. They'll say three things. We'll already know on our own that they said three things. He said, hem amru shloshah devarim, this is not pshat, this is an idea. They said three things, meaning that when a person comes to teach Torah, to learn Halakha, they must take into consideration three things. HaKadosh Baruch what's written in the Torah, and the human beings that you intend to follow this Torah. And if you remove any one of those elements, you take God out of Torah, you take the Torah out of the Torah, you take the people out of the Torah, then you will have an imperfect understanding of how to rule Halakhot. I once heard from a Chacham, and with this I'll end, that one of the downfalls of our generation is that those who are tasked with ruling halachot are usually the people that are so far removed from society that they don't actually know what the human beings are living every day. And I'm going to tell you what I mean. Forgive me if it's too uh, blunt. In the Jewish world as we know it, usually the big rabbis are those that sit in the yeshiva. He's a Rosh Yeshiva, he has students, he has some kolel, he's a Dayan and a Bedin, he sits all day over there in the room with books. And the small rabbis, who are they? They run the Bet Knesset, they run the schools, they run the kids' program, they're small rabbis. Small rabbis don't touch big rabbi things. Big rabbis have no clue what small rabbis do. This is usually in this very vertical society, this is the way that this works. And what you have, especially today, is very different than what we had, for example, among the Sephardim. Among the Sephardim, the Rosh Hashiva was also the rabbi of the community. He was also the Dayan and the Bedin. He was also the father, he was also the, the, the uncle, he was also the brother, he was a person, who was, maybe he was the Shukhet, maybe he was a Sofer, maybe he was involved in every area of life. And when that Chacham ruled the Halakha, he wasn't sitting in some ivory tower, removed from the people. Do you know how easy it is for a Rosh Hashiva to rule the Halakha? He has 300 ducklings that are willing to do everything he says. They walk like he walks, they talk like he talks, they dress like he dresses, they eat like he eats. He has no need to take them into consideration. Uh, uh, Hasidim. Hasidim, like penguins in a row. Whatever the Rebbe says, that's what they're going to do. My life can't handle it, doesn't matter. I'm going to do it anyways. The Maskilim, who hated the Hasidim, you know, they, uh, they used to even make songs. As the Rebbe sings, all the sing Hasidim are singing. The Rebbe dances, all the Hasidim are dancing. All the, this whole... It's very easy to be the rabbi of a homogenous group of people. But when you're a leader for a group of people that are not the same, if you're a leader, of, I just told him last night in my shiur, there are some rabbis that walk into the Batei Knesset and all the people in the Batei Knesset are trying to dress like them. If I would walk into this room and all of the people in the room had decided to, to dress up like me, I would run from the mountains. What kind of crazy people in the world are trying to imitate each other? You live in a Batei Knesset, you live in a community. 
Not everyone has the same level of observance. Not everyone has the same level of finances. Not everyone has the same level of education. Not everyone has children. Not everyone is married. Not everyone is divorced. Everybody is different. And if you wish to be a relevant chacham, if you wish to teach halacha properly to people, you must have the kind of personality like Betilel. That doesn't say, hey, this is the law, take it or leave it. But rather the person says, listen, come, come. Halacha, Torah has, forgive me for borrowing words, Halacha has a spectrum to it. There are many colors in this rainbow. There are many different ways in which to do this right. This generation, this community is not the same as another generation, another community. You are not the same as the person sitting next to you. It's for when a person can come with an animal to a chacham and the chacham says, for you it's kashel, for you it's not. What does it mean? For you it's kashel, for you it's not. You don't have any money. You do. She's beautiful. To someone, she's beautiful. And this idea Halakha has in it so many options is exactly the power that Chachamim have. Which Chachamim? If you don't believe in the Torah, you don't believe in the divinity of the Torah, you don't believe in the authority of the Sanhedrin, of the Bedin Haggadah, of the sages of Israel, so of course you'll say whatever you want. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the Chachamim that are loyal to Jewish tradition, that are loyal to our faith, to our God, to our, to our people. And within those boundaries of Halakha, are able to make halakha relevant in every generation. Be'lad Hashem, next week, we're going to take maybe 15 or 16 examples from Abu Ziyal's Piskei Halakha, one after the next, rapid fire halakhot. And we're going to go through each one and show you how it was his personality as a lover of the Jewish people that ultimately determined whether he was strict, whether he was lenient, whether he was permitted or he prohibited. Be'lad Hashem, I'll see you next week. But for now, thank you so much for learning to all with me. Uh, I will stick around for as long as anybody has any questions or comments. And uh, my wife is giving a shoe in this bed of Milash in about 20 minutes. But until then, uh, I'm here. If you guys uh, need to go, please feel free to go. Uh, Ohad, I'm turning over the shoe to you.